Thanks. Hello. Um, thanks, Robert, for teeing this up this afternoon. Um, my name is Patricia Wouters. I am a professor of international law. I specialize in international water law. I am founding director of the UNESCO Centre for Water Law Policy and Science at the University of Dundee in Scotland in the UK and that's where I'm sitting today in Scotland. Not so sunny but Scotland. I am also a visiting professor of international law at Xiamen University that's in China where we are establishing the first ever international water law research group to look at transboundary water law issues and I am a visiting professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, my own home country, where I work with the Water Governance Group, and I will, I will bring the international law to the table. So I've been asked to speak today a bit about transboundary cooperation, and I'd like to start out by um, saying my perspective is going to be heavily legal, although I've worked in this field for maybe 30 years, and I do appreciate that transboundary cooperation requires an interdisciplinary, if not multidisciplinary team. So I do take on board that the lawyers have to work with the scientists and the policymakers and an entire, you know, broad range of stakeholders. But I believe strongly, and it's from my own experience, that I don't see enough lawyers around the table in the right capacity. And when I say the right capacity, I mean in helping to um, stimulate and facilitate and enhance transboundary cooperation in ways that perhaps uh, I would say as a Canadian, perhaps uh, American lawyers might not appreciate. We don't want litigation. I mean, one of my sayings is real water lawyers don't go to court, at least not in an international setting. I would like to see water lawyers uh, playing a role in uh, devising legal frameworks that are robust, uh, effective, and really help uh, to move cooperation. So. What do I see as some of the major issues today in transboundary cooperation? Well, I'll step back and say that I've, I've just worked uh, all around the world um, in developing and developed countries. And I, I think the problems are sort of two or three things that are, are uh, common in transboundary cooperation, especially at the international level where we are speaking about state state and not uh, necessarily within a sub-federal system like, say, Canada or Australia. I think the issues are very complex at the international level because we have, we often do not have a level, a, a level playing field where country A and country B who share the same water course uh, might be upstream and downstream. My own work right now is looking at how the duty to cooperate, you know, the bedrock rule of international law, facilitates transboundary cooperation and especially this upstream downstream scenario and what I'd like to know is how the duty to cooperate facilitate at its core uh, a healthy um, balancing of state sovereignty because for me especially during during current times where we have so many problems, uh, economic, uh, financial, economic, uh, social, cultural problems right around the world, how can international law and the duty to cooperate in, partic in particular um, uh, support cooperation uh, instead of um, enhancing, I suppose, disparity? So one of the things I think one of the big challenges in international law is using water as a catalyst for peace, which I believe it can be, uh, instead of uh, perhaps a focus for uh, conflict. The other thing I've looked at and I'd like to hear from the audience about is how um, water security, how international law really, I, I've just done a paper recently with a colleague on how international law desecuritizes water instead of securitizes water by taking away taking away um, or providing a framework for addressing conflicts over water and if we look back to um, what is it, the Hague the Hague declaration ministerial declaration we had a nice long list of about seven things that we wanted trans we wanted water cooperation to be about I had a real concern there my concern was uh, 
it just seems to be all things for all people and all things and all ecosystems. Whereas when the, you know, when the rubber hits the road, when we have a conflicts of use, how do we resolve that? And how do we resolve that in a way that respects all stakeholders and all interests and then provides a solution that is based on equity and fairness in a way that is transparent and accessible? And that continues to be my problem, that continues to be my problem. So that's uh, the context. Um, uh, I'm welcoming any questions uh, that might be coming. I see there's there are a few coming. I've got one here um, that's already come through saying, uh, in my country, we want to build a hydropower plant and the World Bank wants to give us funding for it, but our neighboring country tells the World Bank not to finance the plant. Can they do this? So I suppose part of the challenge here, what I would do as an international lawyer, I would step back and say, well, first we have to look at whether there is a legal framework um, between these two countries related to the hydropower plant. And we all know that around the world there are a number of um, uh, infrastructure projects going forward. And where there is a treaty in place, and where there is an institutional mechanism in place, generally a river basin organization or uh, an institutional mechanism created under a treaty, there generally are mechanisms uh, whereby cooperation happens in practice. And how would that happen in this case? So in this case, where we're asking, can a hydropower plant um, uh, be built? Well, generally in international law, where there is a treaty, there will be provisions requiring exchange of information in advance and consultations to determine whether this new use is equitable and reasonable. Because in international law, uh, in international law, the rule is each watercourse state is entitled and obliged, it's a correlative duty and obligation, entitlement and duty, to an equitable and reasonable use of the waters, of the water resources that are shared between the two countries. And, and I like to just sort of provide a footnote here and a bit of, uh, elaborate a bit more on this principle of equitable and reasonable use. Not about sharing the waters per se, it's not a volumetric sharing, it's not quantifying how much water there is in this water course and giving 50% to this country and 50% to that country. In fact, it is almost taking a snapshot of this water course at this time under these circumstances identifying all relevant facts and circumstances and determining whether this use or this enhanced use, this proposed new use at this time is equitable and reasonable given all of the relevant circumstances weighed together and a conclusion coming up on the basis of a whole. So we go back to the hydropower upstream case the first thing we would look at is whether there is a treaty in place that provides for what happens when there is a new or increased use. Where there is no treaty in place and no procedural mechanisms or institutional mechanisms in place, then we fall back on customary international law. The rule of customary international law is still equitable and reasonable use. Where the World Bank is involved, uh, where the World Bank comes in, the World Bank is required by its own uh, statutes and operational policy and operational directives to ensure that there has been notification and also an exchange of information, probably an environmental impact assessment statement uh, on this project. So what would the answer be? The World Bank would not finance this project unless its operational policies and operational directives had been followed and so they would require that there be an exchange of information, that there is notification exchange of information and they would look to see that there is not significant harm caused uh, by this new project. So can they do this? Well, within a context and under certain rules and regulations and procedures, the World Bank might be able to go ahead 
but it would depend on it would depend on really finding a locus of cooperation between uh, between the two parties. Okay, so I see that we might have some more. That's one question. Let's see. I think uh, Robert sent me another question. Why has transboundary water lack international support? encouraging countries to quickly ratify agreements that will ensure cooperation in better utilization of the resources. Why wait, what wait for possible conflicts if we can avoid, avoid them? So that's Fred Mango who sent a question saying, why is transboundary water lack international support in encouraging countries to quickly ratify agreements that will ensure cooperation in better utilization of the shared water resources? Why wait for conflicts? Well, that question really, um, you know, I, I, I'd, like, I'd like to really say something about two universal instruments that I believe we have to look at when we are looking at ratification. I don't believe we always need new water course agreements. So in your context, Fred, I would need to know the region you're speaking about. I would like to see the entry into force of the UN Water Courses Convention, the 1997 Water Courses Convention, because uh, I... I have a statistic that of the 250 major water courses uh, around the world, almost two thirds don't have agreements that apply to them, international agreements that apply to them. In this context, looking at a framework instrument like the UN Water Courses Convention or the 1992 UNEC Transboundary Water Courses Convention, I think would help a region it would help a basin state in particular where there is no agreement to either forge a new agreement or to find out ways of cooperating. So um, why has transboundary water lacked international support in encouraging countries? I think it depends on the country and we see whether they have ratified or what their position has been on the UN Water Courses Convention, the 1997 Convention, or the 1992 UNEC Convention. And that would be actually a platform or a vehicle for encouraging either conclusion of a new agreement um, or finding guidelines, uh, finding a way forward in, in preventing a conflict. Let's see. The next one. The number of shared river basins is known. Why can't this be a target under post-2015 MDGs and how how will countries uh, get this into the national agenda? Uh, gee, Fred, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm sort of clear on the last part of that question. Um, uh, I think what you're looking at is having uh, cooperation based on transboundary water course agreements. I believe strongly that that can be done. I would like to highlight here in particular what I think to be a model of regional cooperation, and that is under the 1992 UNECE uh, Water Courses Convention. Um, there are now 40, about 40 state parties, including uh, the European Union and the UNEC Helsinki, I'd call it the 1992 convention is now open, will be open, I think from this month for universal uh, adoption. And I'm hoping that basin states, especially especially upstream, downstream, and especially where we are looking at environmental issues, where, where we are looking to limit transboundary impact, I, I think um, uh, national governments uh, and basin states would find um, uh, a, solid, uh, a solid history of cooperation under the 1992 convention and I, I'm quite taken actually I'm looking at this a, a bit more closely now in my work as I, I'm looking at a, I'm looking at the Mackenzie River I've got before me the Mackenzie River Basin Transboundary Water Masters Agreement and I don't know whether I certainly did I, I'm from Canada but I didn't know all of the details on the Mackenzie it's one of the largest um, aquatic ecosystems in the world maybe second to the Amazon. It plays an important role in the Arctic and it's shared by so many jurisdictions just across Canada, so three provinces and a couple of territories, the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. And we are looking at cooperation on this transboundary, this huge aquatic ecosystem and having trouble with finding the best way forward. And what, I, what I'm finding is that the regional practice in Europe under the UNECE 
and some of the principles provided for in the UN Water Courses Convention provides a very nice um, framework, legal framework for transboundary water resources management across the board. So I'll look at our next question. Does scale matter? Jonathan wants to know, does scale matter in transboundary water cooperation? Is it easier at the local level? Well, in transboundary water resources management, we have a range of scales. And even at the international level, I mean, water is always managed at the local level. So we need to, one of the biggest challenges in facilitating transboundary cooperation is connecting the dots across the entire water course. So whether it is a, a contiguous river, a successive river upstream, downstream, a shared aquifer, uh, an aquifer and surface water connected system. Um, we always have to look at a range of scales and connect that from the local to the region, to say subnational, national, regional, and then the entire transboundary water, international water course. Um, so scale matters a great deal. and. We address the issue of scale from an international legal perspective by, in, by two ways. The first is international agreements are concluded between nation states. The relationship is state-state. Rules of international law govern state-state uh, relationships. However, when we look at uh, compliance, compliance with international law obligations is always assessed and measured at the national level. If we look at, I go back to Canada once again, we have the Columbia River Treaty in 1961. That took some time to be to enter into force because the provinces didn't agree with what the federal government was going to do. So the issue of scale there, and I think the issue at the complicated issue really in many transboundary contexts, including in the work I'm looking at now on the McKenzie, are really this fragmentation, this overlap of jurisdictions and legal duties and requirements that really make scale a big issue. So I'd like you, Jonathan, to look a bit more at scale and let me know how we do that better. Um, uh, I'm, I'm struggling with whether we should have, you know, once again, the UNEC example has provided us with state practice that demonstrates how layered legal regimes can work well. So we have an umbrella agreement, the 1992 UNEC agreement. The fundamental rule there is that, you know, water core states should limit transboundary impact. And under that umbrella agreement, we have so many bilateral and river basin specific agreements across Europe that seem to be working well, but it's under, it's within the context of this larger agreement. So I think scale, scale is tackled uh, from a legal perspective, legal and management perspective through, uh, through a nested uh, series, a nested legal regime, but that provides problems. Okay, Stephen has got a question. Is the global water crisis one of governance? Hmm. Well, I've seen that quote so many times. Um, governance is part of the problem, uh, but it's not all of the problem. Uh, I don't know. If we think about cooperation and we look at how we address the hot spots or the hot issues, the hot topics for cooperation, generally it's because we don't have, we don't have um, incentives or structures to cooperate. And so I have so many people come back to me and say, and I would say respectfully, wrong, wrong, and, uh, they're, they're, they're wrong when they're saying this, international law does not work. International law does not work. International law works. It's obeyed by most of the states most of the time and it provides a system of governance with specific rules that um, identify the limits of state sovereignty and provide the rules of the game. So at the international level, we have a system, we have a system of government governance that governs interstate relations. But when we look at water governance, 
we have to look also at the water, at the river basin or the water course or the aquifer that we are, are attempting to manage. And it's here where the issue of governance becomes uh, a bit more um, nuanced, shall we say. And so what I've looked at are different institutional approaches to managing water resources. And we have a range of, a range of examples from around the world. We look at the Mekong River Commission, where the four lower riparians have concluded the 1990, uh, 1995 Mekong Agreement. And before that, experienced cooperation on a river basin that was filled with conflict and despite that carried on. Uh, in uh, in peacefully managing the waters of the of the Mekong, you know we have uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, Canadian example um, under a 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty, which has you know, withstood the test of time. As uh, at the International Joint Commission has 100 years of uh, I think successful cooperation, despite despite challenges and despite problems on some of their shared water courses, not the least of which is on, on the Great Lakes, as one example. We've got the European, uh, the UNEC convention, which has a, a system of governance based on a meeting of the parties supported by a secretariat and, and a group of, um, of special task force and uh, river basin organizations at the sub-level who take care of cooperation. So governance, is it one of governance? Uh, I think it's more than that. I think it's really, um, I think it's how we structure uh, the rules of the game, implement the rules of the game, and then find um, effective vehicles for cooperation. Let's see, do you, do you think there will ever be a solution on the Nile Basin? And then another question, will there be a war of water? Um, well, you know, I have been to the Nile so many times. I've been to most of the Nile Basin countries, and I have seen, it's been my own experience, I've seen notable progress and cooperation on the Nile just over the last 10 years. Uh, I think uh, the Nile Basin Initiative uh, provided, um, provided a forum for uh, cooperation, for discussion, and just bringing the parties together and working on things together, I think, has really um, deepened um, operational cooperation on the Nile. Many people have asked me, well, what about the, the Nile uh, Cooperation Framework Agreement? Uh, it's certain it, um, there are still two countries who have not signed that, Egypt, uh, uh, maybe three countries, Egypt and Sudan and the Congo. We have, I think, six other six other countries. I think have endorsed that, or it will it will enter into force when six, I think, have, have ratified that. I think that process for many of the countries is going ahead, but we still have some countries who are not signing up. You know, when I was at the Kigali meeting on the Nile Basin uh, discourse, uh, I think a couple of years ago, what I suggested there was that we move away from the substantive concerns on the definition of water security, move away from the substantive concerns and move closer to procedural cooperation, procedural cooperation, looking at how we work together. And so that Article 14 of the Nile Basin Cooperation Framework Agreement really should be reduced, it, it, it should be, the, fo the focus should be changed really to examining how an institutional mechanism under the Cooperation Framework Agreement could serve as a vehicle for enhancing cooperation and addressing the day-to-day -day management and not wor worrying about the legal definition of water security, but actually moving toward what it means to do water cooperation, water security in practice. So that is just a, a call from me as a lawyer to say that cooperation is realized not only in fighting over water rights and definitional meetings of water security, but actually in looking at how we do that in practice. And I think that really has been the UNAC story, taking a framework instrument and then implementing it in practice. Will there be a war over water? Well, you know, I was at uh, the UN General Assembly. They had uh, in New York in September, they had a special side meeting at the annual meeting of the UN General Assembly. They looked at water security 
And uh, the U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton was there. We had member states intervening. And what I heard, I heard everybody agreeing that we should cooperate more, we need to collaborate. And But I also heard uh, from colleagues there that there already are um, conflicts of use over water all over the world at the local level. I think it was Peter Glick was giving me some details on how many local conflicts are over water and that's my concern. My concern is at the local level there are conflicts of use and that these could spread into regional conflicts especially if we have issues of, of scarcity. So I don't think there will be a war over water but I think that could be some, I think there could be tensions over water insecurity where we don't have enough of the right qual adequate quality of water, adequate quantity of water to meet all of the needs and all of the demands. And I'm really worried about uh, you know, economic development being um, pushing that. What do I, say? I say that because I've never seen so many reports by um, corporate bodies and uh, investment banks on water security as I have done over the last five years. Over the last five years, I have so many security reports crossing my desk from, you know, HSBC, UBS, uh, all of the international banks, uh, Nestle's, you had the McKinsey, Maplecroft, uh, risk assessments, and all of these things are a day for me that, um, that there will be, people are worried, uh, corporates, national governments, um, we just had an international um, intelligence report come out in I think last uh, September or so, identifying potential consequences of conflicts over water. So I'm concerned about that. There won't be a war over water, um, but there will be consequences. Now, Mohammed, Mohammed, there's actually a lot of cooperation, but what about the quality of cooperation? Uh, and then what about hegemony in cooperation, says Tazi. How do power asymmetries affect cooperation? Well, this is an exciting area, actually, looking at power asymmetries, and especially when you put political scientists and lawyers together. And I think it's an exciting avenue of research, something that Dundee has been doing a lot more of, really, trying to bring together um, legal theory and uh, political theory to examine uh, the nuances of cooperation. From my point of view, we can discuss power asymmetries. I see law as having probably the most important contribution in leveling the playing field in terms of defining the rules of the game and providing a forum for resolving disputes where there are problems. So if you think about the, the role of law in society, I think this is something that makes, gives access, gives access to justice, especially to those who often might not have access. So the quality of cooperation counts a great deal. I think a legal regime having agreed rules and an institutional mechanism with a mandate under say a treaty or international agreement helps a lot in enhancing the quality of cooperation and in hegemony in in cooperation i believe that you know uh the rule of law is there really to make uh, to make sure that everybody's voice is heard that everybody has a place at the table that your interests in uh, the use of these waters can be just as uh, important uh, uh, considered, uh, you know, as much by a powerful state as a less powerful state. So that's, that's sort of my take on uh, on cooperation. Um, I have another question here. Are there good examples when neighboring states have very little water or very polluted water but decide all issues peacefully and together? Well, I I recall a comment with a Swiss delegation, actually, when I was in New York at this UN General Assembly meeting, where Switzerland said that although um, they are upstream, um, that they took uh, a very um, balanced approach to uh, downstream states and watched, tried to self-monitor uh, 
pollution or quantities of water. Uh, so I was quite impressed by that. I think Switzerland was on record as saying they are mounting this blue peace campaign where water should be a catalyst for peace. So I give them credit on that. Um, I think the entire uh, UNEC Helsinki Convention, the 1992 UNECE Convention, is based on limiting transboundary impact and so addresses the upstream downstream problem on pollution. And so I think in Europe you have an example of, you know, uh, 40. 40 parties to the convention actually cooperating over 20 years on issues on, which include pollution. Now, Cecilia says, what about glaciers? Are they included somehow in international water law? Well, yes, of course, they are included. Um, I think about some of the work I think some of the team in Dundee are doing in the Himalayas, and I know we have at least one PhD student looking at the Himalayan water tower and uh, the scarcity and the challenges there. The issue about glaciers um, uh, really is, well, I, I think on the Himalayan water towers, you might know more than that, more about that society than I do, but uh, the fact that they um, are upstream and provide so much of the resource on some of the world's major uh, water courses. They have to be considered as an area that should be, you know, protected. Um, and this is an interesting issue because once again, I, I'm looking at this in the context of the work I'm doing on the Mackenzie. We have, and, and oftentimes we don't consider this in international water law when we're looking at allocation issues or pollution issues. There are a number of international treaties, multilateral environmental agreements, like the Convention on Biological Diversity, like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, like Ramsar, that really apply to help with environmental protection and helping aquatic ecosystems. And so I would think that um, protecting the source, protecting aquatic ecosystems, protecting glacier uh, ecosystems, I think fall within even a more broad, uh, a broader remit uh, from an international legal perspective. Uh, the next question, uh, Winston, do we need agreements and or river basin organizations for transboundary basins where there is very little population? So do we need agreements and or organizations for transboundary basins where there's very little population? Well, uh, as a lawyer, I would say yes. Um, I would say yes. Uh, I'm thinking about some, especially small countries that might be surrounded by large countries where you have, you know, sort of the big country, say China, upstream on, you know, about 50 major transboundary water courses, you've got China, and there are some smaller countries around it, like, uh, you know, Mongolia or Kazakhstan, for example. Uh, and in that context, and China is starting to uh, conclude agreements with its neighbors, and I hope it will conclude more, and I hope China will really pick up this its aspiration to be a regional leader on cooperation in its international relations. I mean, that is its, its express foreign policy just now, and I'm fascinated to see how that will, will um, roll out in the transboundary water context. So where, I think for small countries with little populations, Winston, I think it's important that we know the rules of the game, because for a small country, I would imagine that uh, and certainly um, the economics bears this out, uh, where you have access to water, uh, you have access to livelihoods and economic prosperity. So I would guess for a small and for a small population, knowing um, your legal entitlements and also obligations with respect to any transboundary water course would be really important. And so I would encourage, I would encourage that there is uh, an agreement in that context. No. Oh, sorry. I've got a phone ring here. A follow up. A follow up on the war over water question. How would, how would you define a war over water? Would an an economic blockade of a coal riparian be con considered war? Well, 
there, there's been a considerable literature actually on water wars and how water has been used as, you know, an object of, of war um, and an economic blockade of a core war riparian. Well, if you, if you, <laughs> you have to look at from a legal an international legal point of view, you have to look at what uh, the law, you know, humanitarian law and the law of war means. And I'm not really up to my, my law of war <laughs> on that one. But I think any, uh, any aggressive act um, that is a threat to the peace, I would say under the UN Charter, under Article uh, 7, I guess it is, Security Council, any threat to the peace really um, uh, should not be, uh, should be available for sanction. So where you use water to keep another country poor or uh, under, you know, uh, prevent their development, I would say that would not be permissible in international law. Now, Charlene asks us, what about cooperation over water resources in fragile states or those that are at war? Are there principles in international law that should be respected? Well, yes, there are, and it's interesting, but from, you know, my work in this field, I've met just some very um, interesting and uh, people who have been the first ones to go in after war um, and to try to reestablish uh, some sense of normalcy um, after war. And one of the first things they do, they send in engineers to help set up water resources. Um, so uh, there are principles under international humanitarian law. There are uh, principles under international law for, you know, human uh, dignity, um, uh, we have the UN resolution on the human right to water and sanitation. So there is an entire body of law actually relating to um, protection for those in fragile states and for those who are at war. But you would agree, um, Charlene, that it becomes really complicated, um, really complicated to implement that in practice where there is war uh, on the ground as we see unfortunately in too many parts of the world right now that's a difficult one but there are rules of law that apply now dominic said where do you think the draft articles on transboundary aquifers are headed can we expect a new convention well my feeling on that is that um uh i think I don't think we can expect a new convention there. Now that's my view. Um, I don't know whether that's the popular view. Um, my concern is this. I, I think there might be an incoherence between the UN Water Courses Convention, the 1997 one, that took, you know, that took the International Law Commission and the international community about 30 years to negotiate and agree, and there's there's still some some challenges there, but I still believe firmly that this instrument should be supported by national governments, and there should be we should support the international ratification campaign by WWF. I think that is a step in the right direction. I believe that the entry into force of the UN Watercourses Convention will help to facilitate cooperation especially for those countries where there are no agreements in place. So I'm, I'm a strong supporter. But on uh, the convention, on this, on the ILC's work on aquifers, the draft articles on transboundary aquifers, the UN resolution says that countries should take note of uh, the draft. And it might just be left at that. I don't know whether it will go ahead because there are some problems. And I think we have to look at the transboundary aquifers draft articles in the context of, you know, that project really before the International Law Commission started at looking at shared natural resources. So it was more broad, oil and gas and other shared natural resources. And so the transboundary aquifers might be just the first part of a broader project. So I don't know. I think, I think the jury is out on that, but I don't think it will become a new convention. So what do we do? Well, what we do is I think the, the governing rule is equitable and reasonable use. And I, I think this applies to shared ground, uh, ground uh, transboundary aquifers. And I also see that we have some new 
uh, agreements in place on some major transboundary aquifers, like on the uh, uh, Gurani aquifer. So I would say we need a bit more work on that draft, on the draft articles. Um, I think that's the best I could say. Now, Albert wants to know which countries are pioneering innovative mechanisms in transboundary water cooperation. Well, I would, I'd like to point you in the direction of the Global Water Partnership. The Global Water Partnership actually is one of the largest um, NGOs dealing with integrated water, you know, promoting integrated water resources management around the world. And they're looking at what that means in a transboundary context. So they're actually working on the ground to help facilitate transboundary cooperation. So that's in the international domain. But I, I go back to the UNEC, the 1992 convention. If you look at their website and you look at the 40, party, 40 parties uh, to that convention, I think if you look at the 20 years of state practice under that convention, and if you look at the wealth of uh, state practice um, and concrete, you know, operations that they have everything from, you know, I'm quite impressed now with this new implementation committee that to the UNEC convention is going to be having. Um, they have several guidance documents, how to monitor compliance and so and so. So I think that is quite an, an interesting model, actually. I would look at the UNEC. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you've got Canada and the U.S., and I think the U.S. and Mexico uh, maybe we still have some challenges in Latin America. We still have challenges in the Southeast Asia, Central Asia. So there are lots of work to be done. I don't know uh, where we'll be starting. I'm hoping we can make a contribution in. Yeah. What now? Nina says, uh, "Ask where do you see as the most unstable region of the world because of possible water shortages?" Hmm. Well. I'm, I'm, to, uh, I'm quite taken by um, the challenges in such large countries where we have economic development, like China and India, where we have upping down scenarios and problems with, you know, floods and droughts and just huge populations and huge, you know, just a huge uh, economic drive. Um, I, I'm concerned about cooperation in situations where there are not agreements or where the agreements that are in place are not really sophisticated enough or do not provide uh, adequate an adequate vehicle or foundation for cooperation so i suppose i'd be looking i'd be looking towards what's happening in china and india and central asia just now and uh, you know we've had a few uh, complications on, on the mekong with the zaburi dam so I'd be looking at that part of the world, actually. But there are challenges everywhere. I mean, Latin America still, you know, Latin America, Central America still have many challenges. There are not enough uh, agreements, transboundary agreements or processes that are that, that have been taken. So everywhere, I suppose. We have challenges everywhere in transboundary water cooperation. And so challenges mean we also have opportunities. You know, I'm a, an eternal optimist. I think you have to. Spring has to, you have to. Be an eternal optimist in this business, and so everywhere could use uh, your contribution. Can we say that? Um, what has been the impact of WWF's campaign to ratify the 97 Convention? Can NGOs have an influence? That's Mia. Mia asks, what has been the impact of the WWF's campaign to ratify the 97 Convention? Can NGOs have an influence? Well, from my perspective, WWF has done a, just a fantastic job of awareness uh, raising and they've successfully influenced for the right reasons ratification or entry um, accession uh, by many countries over the last, I would say, I would see big progress over the last three or four years. So WWF in becoming a champion really in putting forward informed information uh, about what, you know, the benefits of the entry into force of the UN Watercourses Convention has had an enormous influence and I just commend their work, you know, highly. I think that will make a notable contribution to regional cooperation and something that we will be able to look back in the future and see and measure the impact in a beneficial way. NGOs can have an influence by actually helping 
to spread the word. What, what we need, and it's been my experience really, on, in the field, the reason the UN Water Courses Convention has not been ratified was not because it's an imperfect instrument, is not because it, it's, uh, uh, states don't like it, it's because states are not aware of what's in it for them. So it really is misinformation. Um, and a lack of, usually a lack of human capacity at the national level um, to come to grips with what the UN Water Courses Convention and now the UNECE Convention could bring in terms of helping with the peaceful management uh, of uh, water, you know, shared transboundary water resources. So yes, NGOs can have an influence, I would say probably by using some of the information that WWF and uh, even Dundee is doing on uh, the UN Water Courses Convention. We've got this great UN Water Courses um, user's guide that Alistair Rue Clark and our team in Dundee have put together available on our website. So disseminating that information, raising awareness, supporting the WWF campaign, I think is something you could do. Now Flint, do governance respect international water law? Well, yes. <laughs> My short answer would be yes. Um, do governments respect international law? Well, look around the world. We have challenges. And so my response to this, my response to this is actually what we're trying to do in Dundee and around the world with colleagues is to build this new generation of local water leaders with enhanced capacity so that we could use we could, you know, young people, new people actually can be the future leaders of their countries, importance, realize the importance of water, and, you know, understand it from an inter through an interdisciplinary lens. Look at it through as an economist, a lawyer, policy scientist, and find innovative and new ways, new ways at sort of finding solution. But, you know, law has to be part of the mix and you need some lawyers at the table and we need more international water lawyers and more national water lawyers so that we can ensure that the legal regimes are robust, responsive and really respectful of you know the water course and we can do that we can do that. So Mang, why do we need two global conventions on water? Is it possible to have one? Well the UN Water Courses Convention and the UNECE Convention, they are different animals. They're complementary. We're fortunate to have both, and they sit nicely together. The UN Water Courses Convention, the 1997 convention, is more concerned with allocation of uses in a way. It's sort of a management tool for coming up with equitable and reasonable use and protection of uh, the ecosystem of the water course. It's more, if you, you know, picture it this way, Mang. If you had to decide on who got the water, you know, the upstream uh, state wanting to build the dam or the downstream state wanting to continue with its irrigation and its, uh, its agriculture, what, what rules would you use to determine if that was legal or not? The UN Water Courses Convention, the 1997 convention, provides us with the legal rules that apply in that context. The UNECE convention focuses specifically, more specifically, on limiting transboundary impact. So its aim is very specific, focuses on limiting transboundary impact. So it really is anti, you know, against pollution, having enough water for ecosystems. So it's almost, it's complementary to the UN Water Courses Convention. So the two of them are wonderful tools that I think can help enhance cooperation. Now, is water resource management everyone's business? The broker, oh, <laughs> the broker Dutch organization. Yes, it's everybody's business. You probably know better than I do that water resources management is everyone's business from the local user. I mean, uh, so many of my students go back to their countries and even are teaching, teaching courses on water resources, you know, to school children uh, in public schools and primary schools. And I think every, just this enhanced, this enhanced awareness of what can we say, the finiteness, I know there's always going to be water, but enough water of the right quality in the right places for everyone, and especially, especially in a development context, and especially for the disadvantaged. 
Well, I don't know. I think that's a, let's see, our next question. Um, I am not sure that there can be global conventions applicable to all. I live in a very dry area where we need water to irrigate our lands. Why should we join these conventions and give our water to others? Oh, well, this is an excellent question. Uh, especially a downstream, or you might be a downstream state or even an upstream state where you need uh, water for your agriculture. In a transboundary context, how do you know? How do you know that you will have an equitable and reasonable use unless it is written in law in, and enforced or supported through an institutional mechanism? So especially for issues of, uh, uh, you know, water scarcity, any, any aspect of water scarcity for development, uh, as you said here, for irrigation needs to be secured within a legal framework that actually will work with priorities to protect the resource and also to protect economic interest in measure, in measure. So um, I don't know, I, 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 think, uh, I think this convention would help uh, someone, uh, uh, a national government who wants to protect economic interest, but not, you know, not to the exclusion of others. Oh, so wrong item. Bob asked, what is the first step to a su successful long-term transboundary agreement like the US and Canada? Well, the successful first step, I think, is trying to find a basis for cooperation. It depends upon, I guess, the states you're speaking about, Bob. It would be nice to have a bit more of a context here. In a European context, you already have a framework in place. You have the UNEC uh, 1992 Convention, you have the EU Water Framework Directive, so you already have a pretty, you know, pretty strong uh, legal framework there to build on. U.S. and Canada, well, we have we already have uh, legal frameworks in place. U.S. and Mexico, we already have legal frameworks in place. So if you're speaking about a blank slate, uh, I suppose what I would do is uh, make water a priority, have a look at the U.N. Water Courses Convention, have a look at the U.N.E.C. Convention, and see what you could draw out of those to help uh, frame a legal regime with an institutional mechanism, you know, that, you know, addressed, I always say there are five issues you want to address in any international water course agreement, any international legal regime, there are five things. The first thing is scope, so that you define the scope of the resource. The second thing is substantive rules, so that you know uh, the rules that determine uh, equitable and reasonable use. The third thing, procedural rules so that we actually have a vehicle for communication, what, you, what, you, what needs to be done when there are new or increased uses. The fourth area is institutional mechanism. So I believe that an institutional mechanism and its mandate should be spelled out in the agreement, international agreement or treaty. And the fifth thing, the fifth area we have to cover is dispute settlements so that we have provision for if things, uh, if we have a dispute over the agreement, we know what we're going to do to resolve it peacefully. So that's what I would do. Now, when asked a great question, I think it might be almost our last one, although I'm open, how do we incentivize China to come to the table on the Mekong? Well, China is already on the table on the Mekong. China has already signed agreements that it honors on exchanging hydrological data on the Mekong. It's referred to and included as a dialogue partner in meetings under the Mekong River Commission, and it also um, uh, uh, is referred to in the latest Mekong River Commission work plan. So I think China is coming to the table uh, on the Mekong, um, but there's more to come. So wrap up time. Here we go. Uh, I'd like to direct everybody to the discussion questions on the voices page. I've got, I guess, a few key messages. The first one is that I believe that international water law plays an integral role in facilitating transboundary cooperation. And I would like people to think more fully about the procedural aspects of cooperation, the importance of the legal framework in sort of providing the vehicle or the parameter for uh, institutional cooperation. I would also like to, uh, I'd like people to have another look at universal instruments, the UN Watercourses Convention, 
and the UNEC Transboundary Waters Convention, and to really pull out um, uh, some of the guidance, uh, the substantive rules, procedural rules, the institutional mechanisms, dispute resolution, to l consider each of these instruments as framework guidance uh, vehicles that might be useful in concluding uh, regional uh, agreements or basin-wide agreements. And then I would really throw out a challenge, and my challenge is, uh, you know, to some of us, uh, the more, more experienced or, shall we say, older um, in, in the room, but mostly to the younger people, to tell me, to share with me how we, how we implement the duty to cooperate in a time when integration of all of these things, all of the time and all of the context, really has resulted in sort of a system now that is very fragmented. So this tension between integration, integration of all of the things we need to think about on this water course at this time, with the fragmentation that I am seeing. So what I would like to do is to have a more holistic approach, a more holistic approach, I think that is ba based on, I think on, you know, the optimistic and I think quite right um, aspiration that really transboundary water courses can be a catalyst for cooperation. So I thank you all. I welcome any questions. I take responsibility for any errors that <laughs> that uh, have been expressed today. They are all my own ideas. Thank you very much for this afternoon. I'm going to close now.